I am in the church library. Behind me are lots of kids' books, story books, and look what I just pulled up. I didn't even plan this. Jonah. Literally didn't plan that. I was just looking at the books that I would grab one. The story of Jonah. Perhaps I could just read that to you today. You know, this is one of those story books. This is one of those stories, rather, that I remember as a kid really captured my attention. There are just some Old Testament stories that just do that. In fact, when you ask people about the Bible and you talk to people about the Bible, what really grabs people often are the stories. I mean, later, as we get older, we learn the beautiful passages like 1 Corinthians 13 and various verses in the Bible that give us strength and power. For me, my, what the, the text or the part of the Bible that speaks to me daily uh, in my own life is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, parables, though, are what in the New Testament grab us first, though, the stories Jesus told. And in the Old Testament, the great narratives of the Old Testament grab us. I mean, you know, it's just the way it is, and we stay with them. We just love stories. Everybody loves stories, whether it's movies or books or even songs that tell stories. I think it's why I've always liked singer-songwriters, people who sing songs that paint a picture in your mind. So today we talk about Jonah, and it's a journey. Last week I did a, like a, a, a discussion about just sort of an overview of prophets and prophecy, overview of the Bible, the nuts and bolts, a little bit about what prophets were about. But anyway, today I just want to dig right in. And the kids on Monday had their first session of EBS. And it's not too late. The good thing about technology is if they missed it, they didn't miss it. It's still on there. So get the word out. Let's get some kids going. And let's grow our interest and let's get people involved. So anyway, I give that to you. I submit that to you. So now we're going to talk about Jonah chapter 1. And this is an adult Bible study. Kids, if you have tuned in, you want the VBS version. You want the adult Bible school start, uh, version I mean, not the adult, you want the VBS version that came out on Monday that's got songs and singing and all kinds of great stuff. This is for the adults. Not that you can't watch it, but looking at me, I'm not very exciting. So there you go. All right, so chapter, chapter 1 is where we're at. Uh, Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to read it to you. Are you ready? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying his fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm across arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and, they, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Some of us are spiritually running on empty today. You may be in church every week but you feel far from God. Maybe your prayers seem like empty words and the scriptures seem without life. You hear the songs, but the words seem, the words are there and you hear them, but the power itself is missing. Sometimes we feel spiritually dry, empty, spinning our wheels. We do a lot, but we get nowhere. I believe that the Jonah story can help us. I mean, Jonah is a story about a guy running on fumes. It is the story of a guy who ran from God and when he did, he was running on empty. It is a story of a guy who hit rock bottom. It is about a prophet on the run. For this next, ser this next series of studies, we're going to be looking at this man, Jonah. And I hope that together we can learn that from this not-so-eager prophet that we too may not always be eager. But if we know that and we're willing to make some changes, 
we might just see what God can do. So who is this Jonah? Jonah is the son of Amata, and he is told by God to go and to preach to Nineveh. Some see this as an amazing tale of a prophet who didn't get it. Jonah's story, as I said last week, is found in the Minor Prophets, the Book of the Twelve. It's a complete narrative or story, while other prophetic books contain more prophecy than story. Jonah is the only Old Testament prophet that was sent to a heathen nation to preach repentance. Jonah, you could consider, was an early foreign missionary. Jonah's hometown was gath Hefer in Galilee, and he was a prophet in the northern kingdom before it fell to the Assyrians. So that's your encyclopedia entry. You ready? You ready for Jeopardy? There you go. So what's the big deal with Nineveh, where he was sent to go? Well, again, some more facts for you. Nineveh was on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. It stood across from where the modern city of Mosul, Iraq is today. The residents worshipped idols and gods of Asher and Ishtar. Assyria was a threat to Israel. They were the bad guys. The city was an old one, credited to Nimrod in Genesis as a founder. The city of Nineveh was the capital of the great Assyrian Empire and the enemies of the north who would one day defeat them. Nineveh was in a position that left it in danger to its enemies, and so that may have been, they have been, maybe they have been, that would make them more willing to listen to a message of prophecy. I don't know. Bottom line is, Jonah did not want to go there. He was a prophet, a man of God, and he was going to be sent to the enemy. Didn't want to go there. And so he ran from his call. You read, heard the scripture. He ran. He ran. He was told to go, and he went the opposite direction. He didn't like what God said. He went to the port, and he went headed for Tarshish. We don't know where that was, but maybe as far away as Spain. He went the opposite direction of God. Let's make sure you get that. He went the opposite direction of God. We never do that. We never go opposite of what God says. We never do do this, and we do the exact opposite. I think we've all done that. So why? Why did he say no? Why did he go? Why did he run? Well, first, maybe God's call didn't make sense to Jonah. Why would God want to save the people that are going to be their enemy that could lead to their defeat? Maybe the message, did I get it wrong? Did I hear it wrong? Didn't make sense. Maybe it seemed too difficult. The second reason, maybe it would just seem too difficult. This is too hard. I can't do it. It would be like going to Hiroshima and preaching that a bomb's about to fall. I can't do it. Or maybe Jonah simply, and this is probably it, didn't like it. He simply did not like the call of God. He didn't agree with it. He said no. Like a Jewish prophet speaking to the Nazis. He wouldn't like it. And so you heard, he ran. He ran. He didn't just run physically, though he did. He ran spiritually. Jonah is the only prophet that ran in this way, physically running. They all questioned and gave doubts and struggled like we do. But man, he flat, he headed out of there. So remember the truth. When we run from God, it's going to cost us. When we're running from God, we're going to run on empty. All right, so I'm back in the nursery now. This is a place where we teach lots of great things. Since I'll just go ahead and show you. You ready? You see the wall? I love the nursery. I love the fact that when little children come to church, they can feel at home here. And even as infants, they begin to grow and learn the love and the faith. And down the hall, they begin to learn these great stories of faith, the story of Jonah. Again, a story that we've all heard many times. This Jonah who was called by God and was scared to death. I hope we pay attention to it this time and really pay attention to the fact that this run from God that Jonah did, it cost him. It cost him big. I mean, he's on a ship headed in the opposite direction, but the truth is you can't physically run from God. Isn't it silly that he thought he could run from the physical presence of God? Now, ancient people thought that their gods were connected to the, to the land, and so they thought that they could actually move away from where their God was, but... But Jonah should have known better because this God wasn't like the God other gods people worship. God was always present. But he ran. And then when the storm hits, the sailors are afraid that he has offended their gods. They, they throw stuff off board. They're worried. They're scared. And where did they find old Jonah? Asleep at the bottom of the boat. I don't know how he slept. Maybe he was physically wiped out. Maybe he was emotionally wore out. Maybe this whole experience just devastated him. I don't know. The truth is, though, he was far from God. And it's, the sailors are talking to their gods. But in this story, as you look at it, it says to us that as, as they're there, the great wind is there. The sailors are afraid and cried out to their god. And then they go wake up Jonah, call on your god, 
and they cast lots to find out that it's Jonah's problem that's causing this. Why are you causing this? He says, I'm a Hebrew and I worship God, the God of heaven. One thing I've noticed is in, that, in those nine verses is, is that early, halfway through it, when the sailors talk about their gods, they talk to their gods. But Jonah is just talking about God. Now, maybe I'm reading into it, but I kind of wonder, maybe what we're seeing here is that's the problem. Maybe we spend more time talking about God instead of talking to God. Jonah, if he had been talking to God, maybe he wouldn't have run away. Maybe his spiritual tank was empty, and that's why he ran. Maybe he could have been nurturing that spiritual tank all along the way. The good news is there's always hope because, as I said, you don't run away from the presence of God. God is gracious. And so uh, this fish is, swallows him, and um, he is now in the belly of the fish for three days. We're going to talk about that next week. Hang on. But what a story. So as we think about Jonah on the boat, going the opposite direction of God. The storm hits. They find out it's his fault. They, he, he willingly says to them, it's my fault. And they want to know how to calm the storm. And he says, just throw me overboard. It's my fault. And these men are nicer than Jonah. They don't want to throw him aboard, but they do because they don't want to die. And they don't want to be held accountable for this. So they toss him aboard. And then Jonah, um, at their request, at Jonah's request, is thrown aboard, above, off the ship. And then... Uh, God saves him because he could have drowned. He could have perished in the storm. I mean, when you throw somebody off a boat into the middle of a storm, odds are they'll drown, but God brings this fish to swallow him to keep him safe in the middle of the storm. The fish is not a punishment. Some people think this fish is a punishment. It is a deliverance. It is a shelter in that storm. Okay, so next week we'll talk about him in the fish and what happens and how, what happens when he gets out of the fish. But the question becomes, do we run from God? Do we, like Jonah, head the opposite direction? Do we disobey? Do we talk more about God than to God? When God's call doesn't make sense, do we just check out? When God's call is too difficult, do we check out? When God, when's God's call is something we don't like, do we check out? I think it's interesting in the book of Jonah, we find Jonah being told three times to rise, get up, or go. Verse 2, God calls him to rise and get up. The ship's captain asks him in verse 5 to rise. Chapter 3, verse 2, God will tell him again to rise and get back on track. I wonder if God is telling us to get with it. I wonder if God is telling us to wake up. The truth is, friends, following God is never easy. God's call is not always clear, and God's call is sometimes scary. But when we get up and go, God can do wonders. I wonder if we're ready to have that conviction. Let me tell you about Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther was a great Protestant reformer, and in in, in his goal, though, was to become a lawyer. He wanted to become successful, yet he felt uncertain about life and the spiritual questions. And in 1505, he was walking during a storm when a lightning bolt struck near him. He cried out, help St. Anna, I will become a monk. And so Luther found himself training to be a monk. His father was furious and felt like he was giving his, throwing his life away. He should have been a lawyer, his dad thought. Luther walked to his new um, cloister like a man on death row and announced to his friend, this day you see me and then again, not ever again. Isn't that sad? He thought that by following God, he was giving up everything. He thought that by accepting the call of God, he was surrendering joy and peace and happiness. And he thought he was just giving up life, like it was a death sentence. But Luther did know that even though he was not quite with it, that God must have plans for him. And so he dedicated himself, his new life, to the new work, and he really wanted to please God. If he was going to do this, he wanted to please God. He was a type A person. He fasted. He spent hours in prayer. He often confessed and confessed and confessed. He wanted to please God through his dedication, but he only felt more sinful no matter what he did. He just couldn't get with it. He would say, if anyone could have gained heaven as a monk, then I would indeed have been among them. He wanted to know that God forgave him. He never felt forgiven. His superior's answers to his despair was to give him more work. When he would say that he didn't feel worthy, they'd just give him more. He was so busy, and only when he was busy, he wouldn't worry. He had to stay busy to keep from worrying. And so because of that, he became a brilliant scholar, but he was miserable. He began to lecture and teach on the Psalms and Hebrews, Romans, and Galatians. He was brilliant, and his study showed. As he studied, he began to question his beliefs, though. He became convinced that the church had lost sight of the core teaching of faith, which we now call the doctrine of justification. He felt that the Bible taught that we are saved by faith and faith alone. Nothing we do, it's faith and faith alone. This key Protestant teaching that would launch the Protestant Reformation. And so he began to teach in his teachings that, gift, that salvation was a gift of God's grace found in Jesus only. He felt the church had drifted from this, and he, that was, that's where he felt he was getting despair and fear. Salvation is by God alone, and, he, and we could do nothing to earn it. These convictions led him to get angry over some of the practices he saw in Europe. 
The church was selling indulgences to raise money to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral. You might ask, what's an indulgence? What they would do is you give money and you'll, be, you'll find some forgiveness for your sins. So when you sin, give money and we'll put it on our building program. What an ingenious building program that is. Give money, get forgiven, and we can build this thing. Well, it was, they were building good things, churches, but, but Luther felt this was terrible. He didn't agree. And so he felt called to stand up for the, to, against this practice, to share his conviction that we are saved by faith and faith alone. And some of you know this from history class, how he nailed a copy of the 95 Thesis to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, which began the Protestant Reformation. This act would shake the world. His declarations would then be printed and spread everywhere. I mean, if they'd had the internet, he'd have done this in a day. But within two weeks, all of Germany, two weeks, printing these things and passing them out, it's amazing. All of Germany had heard his message. And in two months, it was all over Europe. That is so amazing. Luther was accused of heresy, and he was verbally attacked by the church. His writings and preaching became popular with the people, but the people in charge were furious. Remember what I said last week when I did this intro, that there's always a Pharaoh and a king who stands opposed to what you're saying. When you, are, when you are an alternative community to the powers that be. We talked about that, what prophets have to do. Luther would have, even though this is past the age of prophets, Luther was very prophetic in what he was doing. And he refused to give up. He was ordered in 1521 to appear before the Diet of Worms, a general assembly of the estates of the Holy Roman Empire in Worms, a town in the Rhine. And it was conducted by the Emperor Charles V and Prince Frederick III. They said, you, we'll keep you safe when you get there. But when he got there, he knew that he was in trouble. He knew that he could lose his life. They had a table in a room full of all the writings and sermons he'd given, stacks of papers of everything he had said and been teaching. And, they, and he looked at all those books and they said, did you write all this? And he said, yes. And they said, do you stand by these books? Well, he realized that the answer to that question, when they said, did you write all this? And he said, yes. He knew that if he said he still stood by them, that could be a death sentence. He could be executed. So he said, can you give me some time? And he went to pray, to talk with friends, and then he came back the next day. And he stood before the most powerful people of his day, and he said these words that have echoed throughout history. Unless I shall be convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or by clear reason, I neither can nor will make any retraction, since it is neither safe nor honorable to set against conscience. And then, in front of all of those who held his fate in their, hand, his fate in their hands, he said the words that have rung throughout history ever since. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me, amen. They declared him an outlaw. Thankfully, they didn't execute him, but they banned his books. They ordered him to be arrested. It was made a crime to even help the man. It was permitted that if anyone killed him, he would not, they would not be punished. He was a man on the run in exile. In exile, he would take the New Testament and translate it into the ordinary German language. Luther's common popularity would keep him alive and he would influence many. His reformation would not stop, and other reformers would step up to the plate. Luther would go into Mary, which was different for a minister, and to change the world. When he died, a simple note was found with his last words. The last words of this man, Martin Luther, who wrote so many words. The last words were this. We are all beggars. Okay, why did I tell you all about Martin Luther? Because Luther, like Jonah, was called. Jonah ran. Luther didn't but Luther sure felt like it. But the point is, all of us who follow God face some tough, tough decisions. Many of you have had to make tough decisions in your life about your, your career paths, about uh, family and friends, tough calls for people you love, decisions that were just gut-wrenching. But the truth is, if it is God calling us to that big job, and even if it seems overwhelming, even if it seems scary, even if it doesn't make sense, if we feel it within our bones and we know this is what I'm supposed to do, well, to not answer that in the affirmative and not to do it, there's just no other choice. And the blessings we receive when we do answer God's call are beyond belief. So what could it be? Maybe God's call is for you to love someone who is pretty unlovable. Maybe God's call is for you to hold to your ethics in a world, a business world that doesn't care about it, that's more into consumerism and profit and margins. Maybe God's call is to be faithful even with family and friends or not. Maybe God's call is to some new occupation, career path, a decision to go back to school, a decision to try something new that scares you. Maybe God's call is to make a tough decision as a parent or as a friend. There are a lot of tough calls. And the thing is, 
if we run from God, then our tank is so empty, we can't, we don't have the energy and the ability to do the work that God has us to do. We've got to stay on track. We've got to stay focused, stay in the scripture, stay in prayer, stay in, engaged, and listen, obey, and have some courage. May God bless you. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we begin this study on Jonah, you call us to do things that sometimes we're not sure, sometimes we're sure, but we don't want to do it. But if we know it's the right thing, sometimes the right thing is the hard thing, but if it's the right thing, there is no other way. Give us the courage to face whatever we may face, to be brave and be bold. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.